Jesus so that we might be able to live. Our service is printed in the bulletin. If you do have the Book of Common Prayer, you can join us on page 276. Would you please begin by kneeling or standing, whichever you prefer. Blessed be our God. Forever and ever, amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns in you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson this morning is from Isaiah chapter 52. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall con contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with, with infirmity, and as from one whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. And we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid him, the, laid him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that has led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. But a per, by a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper." Out of his anguish he shall, see, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Be to we'll read together Psalm 22, found on, in the bulletin on page 4. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, and are so far from my cry, and from the words of my distress? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. 
They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You are my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many young bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their jaws at me, like a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My mouth is dried out like a pot shirt. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust of the grave. Packs of dogs close me in, and gangs of evildoers circle around me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. Be not far away, O Lord. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. Save me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, my wretched body from the horns of wild bulls. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Our epistle reading this morning comes from Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. A reading of the Passion according to John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward, to, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus replied, I am he. J Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. And Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into the sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? 
So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest of the year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teachings. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. And when he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing, warming himself. They asked him, Are you not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to the law, to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. That was, this was to fill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked, them, asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own? Or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release one someone to you at the Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Bar Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. 
He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it, if it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. And everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he thought, brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the palace called the Stone of the Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gartha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Again with him, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate answered them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. Please stand. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and him, with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And this is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fill scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of the hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath especially because that Sabbath was a day of great sol sol solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of, Chris, of scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed the body. 
Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. And they took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. You may be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I know that we Episcopalians and Lutherans don't talk a lot about conversions. It's just not part of who we are. Because we believe by the time or the moment that we are brought before the waters of baptism, we are made into children of God. And it is by God's choosing that he has given us this wonderful gift of his son. But I do believe in a course of a lifetime, we all have experiences that push us forward to follow in the faith, to proclaim the faith that we have been given, to celebrate the identity of who we are, that there are moments that in the midst of our blindness, our eyes are made open because of these experiences. One of the first of these for me in my life was around the age of 14 or 15. I was in ninth grade. My father, who was a Lutheran pastor, uh, was um, actually preaching at the moment on Good Friday. And it was in the evening, I still remember this, and I believe my mother was in the choir, my sister and brother who were much older than I, my brother was in the Coast Guard, I don't know where my sister was at the time, she would have been in college, but I'm sure she was home, she may have been with friends. But I remember sitting there in the pew by myself, that all of a sudden this thing came upon me, as if it finally dawned on me what Good Friday was all about. I found my heart opened to this understanding of what God did for me in this moment that we would see as tragedy, that we see how inhumane we can be to others, especially when we feel threatened. As we watch and we witness once again the story of Jesus being led by false accusations, being tortured and whipped and mocked and ultimately crucified, how horrible. And then it dawned on me that these things were done for me and recognizing that not just for me, but for all people. And there was a sudden wave of guilt and uh, also of a feeling overwhelmed. The recognition that God would choose me. Who does he know? I mean, I'm just a 14 or 15 year old. I'm a, a PK, a preacher's kid. And one that, you know, preacher's kids always have notoriety. Right? Yeah. We're usually the worst of the bunch. Because I think it's some way that we just, we strive to, to be normal like other kids. But because we're put out in the society of saying, you need to act differently because you're the son of a preacher or a daughter of a, a, a priest. It doesn't matter. But in that moment, I recognized what God had done. Not too long after that, I believe the course was already set for me to look to go into ordained ministry. And this in spite of growing up within a, a preacher's family, which can be rather phenomenal and amazing, but it also had its, its, its weights and its burdens trips that were canceled because parishioners got sick or died, things that we were expecting to do or criticisms because the rectory or the parsonage light was left on overnight and somebody would make sure that at the next annual meeting that would be brought up when it came to consideration of the, of the priest's uh, salary. I really was not anticipating ever to be considered an ordained priest. If anything, I resisted it I pushed away from it. <laughs> and yet there were those, my neighbors, my friends, my Sunday school teachers, and others who would come to me and would say, you know, David, you would be a good pastor. 
and I would just kind of, huh. It was not what I felt I was called to do. As I shared with you that Wednesday night, a couple weeks ago, that I really had thought I'd like to be a chef, or even a radio, a, a disc jockey. And actually in seminary for two years, I was a disc jockey for WGET Gettysburg, AM and FM. But it was like God wouldn't let me go. And yet, as I look over the lifetime and the short span of Jesus' ministry, and I see the way in which the disciples react, I also see how I would have reacted, and I do react even to this day, that at times causes me to wonder, why, why, God, would you choose someone like me? From the very moment that we hear of the story of Nathaniel uh, being told by Andrew, look, we have found Jesus, come and see who he is, uh, this, this man from Nazareth, and what is it that Nathaniel says? He says, does anything ever good come from Nazareth? And when people are asking me, you should come, be a part of the ministry, be ordained. And I'm thinking, why? I could do better things. I have greater ambitions. Why would I want to put myself in that position? Certainly there are better things than Delta Township. Uh-huh. <laughs> and yet here I am. And then I think about the disciples, and, you know, in that moment when the sea is, is rocking the boat and they are terrified, and Jesus is asleep in the boat. How is it possible to sleep in the middle of a storm on the sea? Now, I've never been out in the water when it's been storming, but I've been certainly at the, the lake shore, and I could see how nasty it can get. My former father-in-law and I took a, a kayak, or I'm sorry, a canoe, out around the edge of the peninsula in Erie, and we decided to go on the lake side. And the moment we entered into the lake, I realized it was a mistake, because in the bay, the water was much calmer. But out on that lake, even though it wasn't storming, those, those swells were like one to two feet, and they were rocking that little boat. And I could just imagine me just going right over. And I think about the times, that, the challenges that I've had as a, an ordained priest, as an ordained minister, of those moments where you just want to cry out and say, God, help me. I am so afraid and frightened. I don't know what to do. What do we do in the midst of this time of COVID? What do we do when a 30-year-old dies of cancer of the liver? And how do you respond to the family with this loving understanding that you are present, that you are here, and yet I don't know, are you here? I hear the cries of Mother Teresa who says, in the midst of the poverty, that there were those moments that she also questioned, where are you? Don't you care, God? And we hear the rest of that story where Jesus, when he is awoken by the disciples and stands up in this boat that is being tossed about and just says to the storm, peace, be still. And he looks to the disciples and he asks, why have you such little faith? And I think of those moments where I, too, have had those questions, and then I recall the very question that he asks of the disciples, and he says to me, David, where is your faith? And I begin to feel like this big. I want to quit. I want to stop. I, I just, I'm done. But then there are those moments, you know, that, like, Another occasion on the sea where Peter says to, to, to Jesus as he's walking on water, he says, Jesus, let me come out too. And Peter jumps out of the boat and he begins to walk. But the moment he steps on that water, he realizes that this is not really a physical possibility. His common sense is coming to bear. He knows that gravity would have him sink. And he begins to doubt himself. And so slowly or very quickly, he begins to, to go under. 
Peter cries out, Lord, save me. I too have had those moments of boldness where I feel that I could step out and I could walk on water. But then that first challenge, that first notion that, okay, well, what about this? What are we going to do if we can't meet the, the budget, Pastor? What is it that we're going to do if these people continue to cause trouble in our congregation? Are we going to say something about it, Father? And then I begin to feel the gravity and the water beginning to swallow me up. But in each and every one of those occasions, I am also reminded that it is Jesus who pulls Peter out of that water, puts him back in the boat, and he does the same with each of us. He has done it with me over and over and over again, and I don't know why he has so much patience, because to me, if it were me, I would have forgotten about me 30, 40 years ago. I am not the crusader in shining armor. I am not someone who finds himself with this extreme sense of bravery that would stand before an entire crowd and say, you got it wrong, folks. My black brothers and sisters, my brown brothers and sisters, all these individuals that you have cast out or say are not worthy, they are my brothers and sisters. And the moment I'd be challenged I'd be afraid that I'd back off. But I know there are those moments that we see later on in Acts where Peter and the disciples stand up before crowds and there are those who, who come and understand who Jesus is. They join the community. They, they flourish, not because of, of Peter or because of who they are. It's because of the spirit that moves through them. And I realize that in those moments, those, those, those little glimpses of the kingdom are the moments that the Spirit speaks through so loud and clear that there is no doubt in my life. It's not me. It is the Spirit that speaks. And then I think of the times that I think I know better. I know what's best for this congregation. I know what's best for my family. I know what's best for my kids. And I think of James and John or their mother asking Jesus to have them sit at his left or right hand or Simon the zealot that says to Jesus, you know what you need to do, Jesus. You need to raise up Israel to, to strike against Rome. And of course, that was never Jesus' plan in the first place. And there are those today who would have us believe that violence is the way to make things right. And yet Jesus never, ever struck out at a person. There was nothing in our Christian faith that has taught us that we are to strike out against our brothers and sisters, even in disagreement. Even today in our gospel reading, we hear of Peter striking the, the slave, Malchus, and cutting off his ear. We have heard this in other gospel witness accounts. And Jesus says, put away your swords. For those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And yes, there are times that I get angry. There are times that I get furious with people and I get impatient. There are times when I've seen the injustice and the unchristian ways in which people within the Christian church will speak and will act. And I want to slap them. Even though that's not my character. I am not a violent person. It takes a lot to push me, and if you see me angry, it'll be a rare occasion. I might get upset. I don't hide that. But to lose my cool, to flip out, uh-uh. You gotta push my buttons, and if you know what they are, it'll come out. My brother and sister knew how to do that. 
And then again, you know, I wonder this Good Friday, you know, why, why, God, why, why would you even bother to do this for me? And of all the people that I've ministered to in the 30, almost 39 years of my ordained ministry, and those that have suffered through such horrendous diseases and through cancer, through COVID, through all these things that you also have witnessed, to see that young people, children, infants taken from their parents, teenagers who are killed in car crashes, young mothers who succumb to cancer. And I, like Martha and Mary, said, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. I don't doubt that that comment was really a criticism of Jesus because he took his time coming. They did have faith in Jesus, knowing that he could heal Lazarus, but he dallied. And I know they were hurt. And I feel the hurt of those parishioners who have experienced these things, each and every one of us. I know the hurt because it's happened to me in my lifetime with the loss of good friends, the loss of family, the loss of people who cared about me. Lord, where were you? And then I'm sometimes nudged, and sometimes it's a swift kick to the backside, that I hear Jesus saying, I've always been here. Open your eyes. Clear your head of your doubts. Clear your mind. And know that in the midst of all these things that occur, there has never been a promise that life for you or anyone else was going to be easy. If anything, the moment that you were brought into my family, a whole world of challenges was laid ahead of you. But know this, just as Jesus spoke to the disciples following his resurrection and saying, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you, I do so with you. And so my travels in my lifetime from the beginning of my ministry in northwestern Pennsylvania has brought me from there to upstate New York to go from a parish ministry to start with two churches, go to one that ultimately became three then moved to an institutional setting as a chaplain for a long-term care facility, only to be called back to northwestern Pennsylvania to serve a large <coughs> congregation as senior pastor, and to move from there to, to Michigan, of all places, a place where Judy says, why do we want to go to Michigan? It's just like Buffalo. <laughs> and when I was first told by the congregation I ultimately would serve, that they had found somebody, Judy's response was, well, that's a good thing. And as we're out in California, thinking where we needed to be, I thinking I would love to be in California because there, in the midst of the grape growing region, I could be a tent making ministry. I could be rector, I could be pastor, and also be a vintner. And that fateful day, after an interview with a congregation in Ukiah, California, sitting in an Applebee's, celebrating the fact that we full well knew we were coming to California, only to have my bishop call me and say to me, I got another congregation for you. And I said, where? And he said, Grand Rapids. I said, Grand Rapids? I said, what church? St. Luke's. I said, I just interviewed there. They turned me away. He said, well, something has happened. The young pastor that they called decided this was not where he was supposed to be. I gave them two options. One is that they could go over the list of pastors that they had interviewed, or I could give them a whole new slate. And then he says this. And I was surprised to hear they wanted to interview you again. Well, thank you for the confidence, Bishop. <laughs> and 
as it was. That's how I ended up in Michigan. And even though there were things that were up and down with that congregation, there were moments also of wonderful opportunities, meeting unique and amazing people who were witnesses to God. And in the process of that, by becoming a friend with a local Episcopal priest and being asked to begin to fill out those moments when he was on vacation to do the midweek liturgies, to do their mass, and to be given entrustment to that. And ultimately, when he retired, and to be asked then to serve part-time with the canon who was assigned there initially, gave me a whole new world and an understanding. Now, mind you, I've always been very ecumenically minded. And again, it's amazing how the spirit works. But I believe it's because of those things that has now brought me here to St. David's. And what you receive in me is a person that is no different than you, who, like Peter, has denied, has had his doubts and his moments, who, like the other disciples, when Jesus was at the cross, they all scattered and ran, but yet also as one who knows because of today. Because today we know it as Good Friday. A good day. Even at the cost of Jesus, or God's own son, it is good because it is Jesus' blood that is poured out for us and that we have a God who cares and loves even in the, in the midst of our bumps and grinds in life. And even in those moments, we want to turn around and run. It is God who brings us together and says, follow me. And so I hang on to Jesus as desperately as I can. And I invite you to follow me. Not me, but to follow Jesus to follow your priests, to follow Reverend Carroll, to follow Father Dave, and ultimately to follow your new rector. Today is a good day. And just like the disciples, with all their questions and their hurts and their pains, today you and I can silently give thanks to God that he has chosen us to be his family. You are loved. Know that. And even if you don't feel it, it doesn't mean that God's not with you, because God is. And that is the joy in which we receive today. A blessed Good Friday to you all. And may you continue to hear the voice of God calling to you. Come follow me. Amen. I ask that you please turn your prayer books to page 277 or page 10 of your bulletin. Please kneel or sit as you desire. <clears throat> Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death, and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity and witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for, <clears throat> for pr Prince, our provisional bishop, for all people of the Western and Eastern dioceses, 
for all Christians in this community, for all who are about to be baptized, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in your voc their voc vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth for those in authority among them, for Joseph, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for Gretchen, our governor, and for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility and dominion may increase, until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions, and give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on those who do not know you as you are revealed in your son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have departed this world may have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone. We may be a company worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, 
look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that, that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We glory in your cross, O Lord. And praise and glorify your holy angels. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because, because by, by your, your holy, holy cross, cross you have redeemed, redeemed the, the world. world. If we have died in him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. We adore, we adore you, O Christ, Christ and, and we bless you. Because, because by your, your holy, holy cross, cross you have redeemed, redeemed the world. world. O Savior of the world, who by your cross and precious blood you have redeemed us. We beseech you, O Lord. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we have sinned against, against you in thought, thought word, and deed, by, by what, what we have done, done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. repent. For, For the sake of your Son, Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, have mercy on us and, us and forgive us, us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Our Father, who art, who art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Those who would like to receive the body of Christ, please come forward.
Turning to page 14 in your bulletin, let us pray, saying together, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, and in the hour of our death. Please receive in grace to the living, pardon from the rest of the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life, and for with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. We will dismiss in silence. <laughs>